This is going to be a great interview for you to watch if you are concerned about how we are teaching American history to our K-12 students. Today I'm sitting down with Dr. Phil Magnus, someone I've wanted to interview for a very long time. I consider him to be an expert in the 1619 Project. He even wrote a book, The 1619 Project, A Critique. I highly recommend it. He's an economic historian whose work focuses on the United States and the broader Atlantic world. His research explores the intersection of history and political economy, including the 19th century, as well as longer term trends in the macro economy, such as taxation, trade, and economic inequality. He also works on the political economy and business ethics of higher education. So if you're interested in higher education, I would recommend you take a look at the book he co-authored with Jason Brennan, Cracks in the Ivory Tower, The Moral Mess of Higher Education. Today we sat down to talk about the 1619 Project itself, the critique of the 1619 Project he wrote, scholarship in general, the 1619 Project curriculum, and what he thinks you as parents can do if you cannot get 1619 Project out of the classroom. What can you do anyway? So without further ado, welcome to The Reason We Learn and my guest, Phil Magnus. So, Phil, you heard about the 1619 Project for the first time. How? Did you like pick up the New York Times magazine and read it or did someone call you? How did you first hear about it? It was the morning that it was published in August 2019. And basically what I did is I opened up the newspaper that morning and there it was. So I, I was originally uh, fairly excited about it um, because I thought, you know, the New York Times is devoting an entire issue to the subject of slavery, which is something that I study. Right. And I start reading it thinking this is going to be a continuation of a project that they did a few years ago called This Union, which was to mark the 150th anniversary of the American Civil War. And uh, it was a very scholarly, well-rounded take on that anniversary. I wrote a couple pieces for it, uh, as did uh, dozens of other uh, academics that work in slavery in the Civil War era. And I thought, okay, well, uh, the New York Times is continuing this tradition of focusing on history. Uh, about 10 minutes into the project, uh, I realized it was very much not that. It was a, uh, a political argument that was essentially adopting and weaponizing elements of the past to uh, advance a 2020s era uh, political agenda that uh, tended to be on the very far left. Um, by first... Uh, Kind of red flags about it. it was when I noticed the uh, it wasn't the title piece by Nicole Hannah Jones, uh, even though I saw some some th claims that were made in that that were kind of iffy and questionable, and we can get into those. But it was really the second essay by Matthew Desmond, and that's the one that links capitalism, American capitalism, to slavery. And I start reading this. This is an area I've directly written on, published uh, probably over two dozen scholarly works in the uh, uh, the history of slavery and uh, its economic dimensions, the Civil War era. Uh, so it's a very much an area that I have active scholarship in myself. And what he was claiming uh, was not only outright wrong, it drew upon a body of scholarship that I had engaged in before and rebutted, a uh, body of scholarship that has clear, unmistakable economic errors to it. And he's just repeating it, almost regurgitating it as if it were fact. And it all lined up with this very clear political uh, message, which was aimed around the year 2020, uh, to discredit capitalism in the modern day by rewriting the history of it and linking it more explicitly to the slave system as if they're wedded at the hip. Interesting. One thing I would love for you to do as a scholar is to explain to my audience what you mean by scholarship and what you saw right away as the difference in between what you're accustomed to that makes something a scholarly work and a scholarly examination of history versus one that is really kind of dressed up opinion. I've noticed this in looking at a lot of things coming out in the last several years, but I am not a scholar, so I have trouble explaining to my audience. Can you do that for us? Absolutely. So uh, scholarship, I think unfortunately we live, we live in very perilous times. Scholarship itself is in decline, uh, including scholarly rigor and standards that are associated with that. But the, you know, the traditional way that historians and economic historians, and actually really all scholars in the humanities and social sciences, all the way up to the hard sciences, the physical sciences, um, should approach things, uh, should approach their work, is building up a logical progression of evidence, working through a problem, 
uh, remaining open to testing the questions that are around that problem of picking a, uh, a topic of scholarly investigation and following the evidence wherever it may lead. Uh, to the historian, this often means uh, digging into the archives of uh, assessing and reassessing and reexamining documents, uh, pairing those with new discoveries as well, to come up with a plausible interpretation of the past that is rooted in what material uh, you can bring together uh, to, to, to tell us about what actually happened, you know, to tell us about how uh, figures in the past uh, saw themselves as events unfolded, how they reacted to those events. And then also we can talk about how those events were subsequently interpreted by later generations all the way up to the present. This is all a part of the historical process of doing scholarship, but it needs to be rooted in something. And the further you move away from an event, the more you have a body of uh, historical work that's been developed in between that event and the present day. And part of the historian's role is not only to recount what happened in 1850 or 1776 or 1619, it's also to recount and assess and account for how other historians have written about that event uh, between that time and the present. And sometimes that involves a correcting error. Sometimes it involves uh, adding new interpretations that were missed, but you have to bring that literature into consideration. In other words, you, you're basically just kind of like flying in the dark on, uh, on your own interpretation. And the mm -hmm. further you move away from that, uh, the more uh, uh, danger emerges of getting off track from a true scholarly discussion. This is something that I think the 1619 Project uh, is highly vulnerable on, uh, has uh, kind of committed um, many transgressions against normal scholarship, although they, they play these word games that they, they pretend to be history when they when it serves them to be history, then they uh, retreat to claiming that they're engaging just in journalism when uh, it serves them to be journalists, although I'd argue they've, they've breached professional ethics of both historians and journalists in the way they presented themselves. Uh, but the issue here is that you have someone like Nicole Hannah-Jones and Matthew Desmond and some of the other writers for the 1619 Project. They do not approach history mm -hmm. by starting from the evidence as an interpretive point and then encompassing what has been written around that subject uh, in the time since then. Rather, they approach history from a preset, predetermined political narrative that's wedded to the 2020s. Uh, it's wedded to uh, presentist political interpretations. And then insofar as they go into the past, the only thing that they're doing is they're going back and they're cherry picking bits and pieces of information or bits and pieces of the scholarly literature uh, based on whether or not it agrees with that preset interpretation. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's something Nicole Hannah-Jones did uh, very egregiously in her piece. Matthew Desmond did even more egregiously in his piece is when they invoked other scholarly works, they only narrowly confined uh, their survey of scholarly works to people that already agreed with this interpretation that they wanted to tell and anything else. And, you know, when the history of slavery, we're talking about thousands, if not tens of thousands of scholarly works dating back over a century and a half. Uh, anything else that goes against that narrative, they ignore, they set aside, they pretend as if it doesn't exist. Right. And, you know, so for for the audience, can you explain what the difference is technically between journalism and, you know, historical scholarship? Sure. You know, being a historian versus a journalist, for example. You know, a, a journalist uh, in many respects is a, a, a chronicler of events as they unfold. And there are some interpretation added to that. You know, we divide journalism up into a variety of categories. There's the strict traditional reporter who is aiming to describe events that are, are happening right now. Uh, but there are also areas of journalism. You expand that definition to recounting uh, the police chase on the highway. You know, that's the, the, the standard local news story or recounting the fire that happened. Uh, that's basic traditional reporting. Uh, you expand that definition. You also get into feature and commentary reporting, which is a mixture of recounting events as they're unfolding and then also adding interpretation to it uh, that often comes from the, the journalist him or herself. Mm -hmm. And then on, the, on the, the far extreme of that, the other end of it is um, editorial journalism, political commentary. This is uh, opinion journalism where you are bringing not only uh, 
direct, positive, empirical descriptions of what's happening, but you're bringing normative values to judge and interpret those events as they're happening. This is the stuff that, uh, you know, the purest form of it appears on the opinion page. It's separated from the rest of, uh, of uh, a newspaper. Something like the 1619 Project, it kind of straddles the two. It was put in as a magazine feature of the New York Times. So it's a commentary magazine, even though it's also a journalist project. Uh, and then it's also dabbling in the editorial world. Uh, right. So the, the, there's a, a big spectrum of things that it's trying to achieve, even within journalism itself. Now, what does that mean in its relationship to uh, to scholarship? Well, the traditional hi historical scholarship, uh, first off, it tends to be much longer and broader in its focus than these short uh, a couple thousand word vignettes that are appearing in a journalism outlet. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking about complex events in American history. Uh, they normally you know, take up the size of a book, uh, hundreds, if not thousands of pages devoted to a very short, uh, narrow topic that has a lot of complexity. Into and it. then citations, scholarship. you need citations and, you know, yeah. things like that, you know, uh, primary sources. And, you know, I've read some Barbara Tuckman and it's like, you know, it's intense. It's of footnotes. <laughs> yeah. Right. And uh, so, and all, it, I mean, it, that's one thing that I noticed. I was kind of like, you know, hello, yeah. <laughs> where's this coming from? Yeah, you, it, as a scholar that's writing history, you're basically leading a roadmap. Uh, you're providing a, a roadmap for your reader to reconstruct where to go in the archives if they want to find the information that you are summarizing and presenting before them. It's also a roadmap of what are the other scholars that have written on this subject and what have they had to say about it and how do they differ from your interpretation? Uh, you can You can follow them. Uh, theoretically, like if you have the the time and energy to reconstruct a scholarly work, you could do that from the footnotes if it's a proper scholarly work. Uh, journalism, there's no footnotes. Hmm. And so as a person concerned with education, and this channel is devoted to that, I had all the same concerns you you have without the scholarly background, just enough to know that like this doesn't look rigorous. This doesn't look good enough, you know, just to even be making the claims it was making yeah. in the New York Times magazine. When I heard it won the Pulitzer Prize and was becoming a a curriculum for K-12, all kinds of warning bells went on, uh, went off for me because I, I majored in American studies in college yeah. and spent, you know, the lion's share of my time taking history class, you know, like I just dove into it. And the revolution was my particular interest. Um, and I realized immediately, if you take kids kindergarten through fifth grade, I mean, they haven't touched any American history other than making a turkey at Thanksgiving, really. I mean, there's like very little that they've done. Maybe they know who George Washington is, okay? And you start diving into slavery and you start diving into these things completely out of context. And now you have a political narrative around it and an economic narrative around it. There's, I wouldn't do it with history I thought were was accurate because it would be nothing more than indoctrination. You can't, I try to explain to parents and tell me if you agree with this. If you teach information to a child before they have enough background knowledge to challenge you, before they're even literate enough to read the background knowledge to challenge you, you will be indoctrinated them by definition because it is going to be your interpretation or your pick, you know, selection of the knowledge to impart. And all they can do because they're getting evaluated or that's their class they're compelled to sit in is absorb it. That's it. They have two choices, <laughs> absorb it or completely reject it, in which case they might get in trouble. And that is the definition of indoctrination. You're not asking, well, what would you think about this? You're saying this happened. And as I look at the curriculum, that's what it is. And it's not accurate. So I'm, I mean, do you agree with me that that is indoctrination as a definition, a fair definition of it? I think what's going on here, you put a teacher in front of the classroom, that teacher is not only the disseminator of information and content, that teacher is now in a position of authority. Right. And part of that authority is uh, is based on the reputation that the teacher is, te is providing accurate information to students. Right. And when we see something like the 1619 Project adopted as a, uh, a primary means of teaching American history, and make no doubt that's what they're doing, there's an that entire curriculum that was built around it. Uh, that the, the New York Times funded and, and got support for through the Pulitzer Center. Uh, they rolled this thing out as, as like a multi-million dollar package to uh, 
uh, not only present to the readers, but to also promote in the classrooms. Uh, but when you elevate that to a position of authority and uh, combined with that authority, you're not presenting other viewpoints, not presenting other sides uh, and other interpretations. And Nicole Hannah Jones has been very explicit about this, that she only wants to, uh, to present and instruct on her one interpretation. She's got no patience, no tolerance, no room for anything that even moderately disagrees with her. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, this is kind of a, um, a, a dangerous scenario to be in because not only is it a one-sided history, as we've seen in the uh, the aftermath of uh, of this project as it's been scrutinized, uh, not only by myself, but by dozens of other scholars across the political spectrum, right. from uh, free market libertarian to outright socialist. Uh, there are biting cr uh, critiques of it uh, from across the spectrum. Right. And, and what you find in all of them uh, is it's just not good history. It's not well done. It's something that... Uh, uh, stumbles its way through error after error and uh, almost haplessly at, at, at moments as if uh, uh, like people like Nicole Hannah-Jones and certainly Matthew Desmond did not do their homework before writing up what they presented as authoritative accounts of major events in history. And I, I noticed even looking at the, uh, the lesson plans, you know, you have things that are labeled as all grades. Yeah. Well, all grades goes down to kindergarten. Yes. And you have these, you know, guiding questions and they are leading questions. You know, they're leading questions. They're not, they're not questions that ask children to think yeah. they sort of have the answer baked into the question. And, um, you know, they have reading guides, like they don't, you know, they're not even saying here, read this. What do you think openly? I mean, first of all, a kindergartner can't read. So why would you say, why are you saying all, oh, I shouldn't say that my kids could read, but what, you know, they certainly do not read with the level of comprehension and understanding. And even when you have comprehension, if you don't know the background, if you don't know any European history, right, you don't need world history. How do you teach the American revolution or slavery out of context of world history? It makes no sense. It's, it, I'm, I'm going off on a tangent, but I, I get passionate about this because I feel like um, it's not just that this thing exists because people will say, well, you know, she's entitled to free speech. She's entitled to publish this New York Times. Entitled. Of course, sure. absolutely. No one's saying otherwise. But does it then follow that she is entitled or the or Pulitzer or anybody else is entitled to have this be adopted by, for example, government schools, public schools? Through political means. Correct. And does it also then follow that challenges to that are met with the kind of response that you would reserve for people who have no standing at all, like, yeah. you know, some random person. And there's you, you know, a, a scholar, a legit scholar, not a journalist, but a scholar in these areas, plus dozens of other scholars saying, here are our detailed critiques that, you know, we've gone through and given you reasons and you get the one pat answer. Well, you just... You know, right. <laughs> you're this kind of person, ad hominem attack. Um, so let's talk about some of the specifics. Yeah. Because for those people watching who may not be familiar with 1619, and I, I meet them every day, they've heard of it. But the response I get is, is that the new history curriculum? Or is that that really controversial new thing where they want to teach the true history of slavery? That's another thing they're calling it, the true it's history. Right. Right. So it's been branded as real history, true history, the history people don't want you to know, these kinds of things. And so I have tried to give examples where I have a problem with it. Can you give, let's say, your top three or four biggest errors that people need to understand or errors that ought to be clear to everyone? Yeah. Or mistakes. So the biggest error are almost con all concentrated in the Matthew Desmond piece, the uh, the piece that links the history of slavery with the history of capitalism. And I've even gone so far as to say this is the only piece in the 1619 Project that should be outright retracted. I think it's that bad. Um, it, it is uh, just riddled with errors from start to finish, and I don't think there's any chance to redeem it. Uh, you could make corrections to some of the other essays where they go astray, but the Matthew Desmond piece and the problem here is he's constructing a thesis that basically says American capitalism today, 
and, and what he's he's playing fast and loose from the words because when he uses capitalism today, he's referring to free market, laissez-faire, get the government out of the economy. As if we have um, that. <laughs> exactly what you'd, you'd think uh, the term would be used in 2020 to describe. Right. Uh, but he is conflating that with a literature that, that plays kind of a sleight of hand game where they attach the word capitalism historically to equal more or less stuff I don't like. Yeah, stuff I don't like about the past. So oftentimes the historians that write about capitalism and slavery, what they're really referring to is an earlier system of economic uh, organization called mercantilism. Uh, mercantilism is kind of a quasi public part, uh, pu public private partnership where the government manages the trajectory of trade and picks the industries that are winners, the things to emphasize on, which is very rooted in the colonial system. It's, it's, uh, the, uh, the government back in England and the companies back in England deciding how the colonies are to be economically planned and managed. That's not free market capitalism. That's a uh, an older system uh, that has very clear, precise uh, names and terminology in, in the academic literature. Well, what the uh, the historians that Desmond relies on have done is they redubbed re mercantilism as capitalism because they know they can tie mercantilism to slavery. Uh, what's the Desmond thesis? Well, he basically says that uh, uh, the history of slavery has infused American capitalism with the brutality and the evil of its system. Uh, and that this, this infusion taints the trajectory of American capitalism from the 18th and 19th centuries to the very present day. Uh, he's basically saying that America is a wealthy country in the world today because it was all built on the backs of slavery. Except the South was less wealthy than the North, and that's why the North won the war and the Civil War that, you know, that held them back economically to use slave labor. And I mean, there's so, to, to me, you know, as a student of history, I read something like that. And that's what I'm saying for children who are not steeped in this history. Yeah. And they hear something like that. It might make sense. I mean, it sounds logical. You know, they see big pictures of plantation homes and, sure. you know, all this. And you think, oh, yeah, rich people and so forth. They seem to completely ignore the fact that slavery was pretty dominant in half of the country, not even really half, yeah. but you know, the South Other, yeah. and that it, it was restrictive. It was so restrictive on the economy that they, it was, it, it limited diversity in terms of their, their ability to, to work there. The poor white people had no, <laughs> they were not marketable as far as their skills and so on. And, and, or at least their labor. And, um, that holds you back from being wealthy. Yeah. This was an old observation that the abolitionists made before the Civil War. You had abolitionists from the North and they would travel into the South to just see what was going on there. And of course, they're looking for to see the slave system in action and re report on the brutality. Right. But one observation that you see over and over again from abolitionists that travel into the South is they look around and they're like, oh my gosh. Uh, this place is an economic backwater. Where are the factories? Where are the railroads? Where are the cities even? Uh, you compare the populations in northern versus southern cities. Uh, another uh, indicator, when immigrants moved to the United States in the 19th century, where did they choose to end up? They went to the places where there was work, where there were opportunities. And by the, the eve of the Civil War, uh, the trajectory of immigration is overwhelmingly in the north. They don't want to live in the South because there's no economic ac activity there. Uh, there's no chance to uh, to improve yourself unless you show up with money already and maybe buy a plantation. Right. Uh, so you see this theme playing out very clearly in history. And yet what the uh, uh, the Matthew Desmond uh, writers and then the scholars he depends on, they call themselves the new historians of capitalism. Uh, what they do and I made this argument explicitly uh, long before the 1619 project, they unwittingly revive and rehabilitate something that was known on the eve of the civil wars, the King Cotton thesis of economic production. And the King Cotton thesis, this was put forth by a bunch of slave owners. What they said is cotton is such a central single product to the American, American economy that if you do anything that disrupts slavery, messes with slavery, it's going to have repercussions worldwide and lead to a worldwide economic collapse and depression. Uh, basically, they're saying you Northerners and also you Europeans that use uh, cotton in your textile mills, uh, you depend on us. We're that important. So if you make war upon slavery, you're really making war upon yourself and you're going to destroy your own economy. And this is why the South, they're so confident in this thesis that they think that they can go it alone in the Civil War and emerge triumphantly 
because cotton is such a central piece. It'll bring the European powers to their cause. It'll give them economic leverage over everything else. Uh, none would dare wait, make war upon cotton, and therefore none would dare make war upon slavery. So they think that they're going to emerge triumphantly out of the Civil War because they have the advantage of cotton. Well, it turns out that's not what happens. In fact, the opposite happens. The South is economically stagnant. It's industrially decades, if not centuries, behind the northern economy. The northern industry overwhelms them during the war. Right. Uh, it's, right. you know, the, the war itself is the testament that this economic theory is wrong. And what the new historians of capitalism have done is they're anti-slavery themselves. So they're not trying to re revive King Cotton as a pro-slavery argument, but they're taking its economic pr uh, propositions and assumptions as if they were true and valid. Uh, and asserting that this therefore indicts capitalism along with slavery uh, based on economic theories that have basically been discredited in real time by the Civil War and its aftermath. It reminds me, too, of when they mischaracterize the three-fifths compromise. Right. You were like, you, you do realize you're arguing in favor of Southern power in Congress, right? right? Like, you do realize, like, your version of it... it if if they hadn't done that, if it's oh, they're whole people, <laughs> you know, yep. um, the South might have had a lot more power than it actually did. It was actually genius. Um, you know, if you can't end it, deny them as much uh, representation as they would like to have. And I have had to explain that to people who ought to know better. In other words, they've graduated college. So they've at least had high school history and, you know, maybe some college history. And yet this myth will not die. Yeah. And then when you see it again in, in things like this and the other one you pointed out in one of your articles, uh, I think you pointed out the, um, I don't know if it was an accidental contradiction or what, where Nicole Hannah-Jones in her piece in, in, in one part says, well, the, the, the United States from its outset was just, you know, the, the Constitution is invalid because of slavery, because it didn't outlaw slavery right, you know, from ratification. And then turns around and says, like, well, it took black people, you know, to drag America to live up to the ideals of the Constitution. It's like, I'm sorry. I, wait, the yeah. Constitution that was not worth the paper was written on at the beginning of the essay is now the thing that is it, only good because uh, what? So it seems like she wants to have it both ways, even with the Constitution. Yeah, she has a very confused argument on constitutionalism. And so one of the critiques that I've offered on this is we need to turn back to the abolitionists themselves. Frederick Douglass uh, gave a very famous speech in 1854 yes. where he says the, the U.S. Constitution, and the, here's the important line, properly construed is a liberty document. Properly construed, properly understood. And he also said, he makes the same point about the Declaration of Independence, uh, the revolutionary ideals themselves. Douglass's greatest weapon and the anti-slavery fight is going back and pointing at the revolution and saying, this has set forth a philosophical ideal for a world in which slavery is plainly wrong and slavery cannot continue to exist. We are failing those ideals. Right. So Frederick Douglass's greatest weapon in pleading the case to abolish slavery is the fact that slavery is in direct contradiction with the American founding. You have someone like Nicole Hannah-Jones, you know, as I mentioned, economically, the 1619 Project rehabilitates unwittingly the King Cotton thesis. I would argue that uh, constitutionally and legally, the 1619 Project rehabilitates uh, the Roger B. Taney decision in Dred Scott versus Sanford, which is a repudiation of these Enlightenment ideals that consider slavery to be at odds with the constitutional order that they set up after the revolution. Uh, and this is a point that, that uh, Frederick Douglass makes in his attack on Dred Scott. Abraham Lincoln makes it in his attack on Dred Scott, uh, that this was a reinvention of the constitutional order. So you have someone like Nicole Hannah-Jones. She uh, she's basically accepting the validity of the Dred Scott decision, even though she clearly disagrees with its outcome, but she's accepting its legal validity and its underlying legal theory as if it were true. But what do we know of the Dred Scott era uh, after this case? This is a hotly contested case. Uh, the northern half of the country completely rejects the constitutional jurisprudence behind it, thinks it's an abomination. It's the thing, one of the major factors that sows the seeds for the Civil War is resolving 
this uh, activist Supreme Court case that's been thrust upon them that forces slavery to be accepted as a part of the constitutional order when prior to that point in American history, it was vigorously contested on the exact grounds that it was a philosophical contradiction. And now imagine that the South had more power in Congress. Right. <laughs> <laughs> on top of it. Oh, my God. So, um, OK, so we've got a couple of examples. Is there is there anything that you see in there that gives you the impression these mistakes are intentional? In other words, I know I, I, it's fairly obvious there is a political argument being made and there's cherry picking going on. But what I'm trying to figure out is chicken egg here. Yeah. Is this coming from a position of just ignorance or miseducation on their part? You know, was she zinified or something and then, you know, this happened? Or was this done with a goal in mind of in miseducating this generation to achieve a certain goal, namely like throw out the constitution, not just to like rewrite it, but like get rid of it. It's invalid. Like I've heard people say it's illegitimate and their argument has been, I read it in the 1619 project. So do you think, I mean, I, you know, can't know. I'm yeah. just asking for your opinion. Yeah, I, I can't tap into what her intentions were or what the other writer's intentions were. What I do know is that they had a very sloppily assembled project uh, in terms of historical interpretation. Uh, this is something where I think Nicole Hannah-Jones had her thesis of American history. Matthew Desmond had his thesis of American capitalism uh, before they even started to investigate what that thesis was. Uh, they had a narrative that they wrote out, and it was a very political narrative suited to their own uh, goals in uh, the 2020s uh, in terms of American politics. And this is why they pivot back and forth between issues that happened 300, 400 years ago, and then they'll throw in an aside, and this is why we don't have uh, socialized health care, or this is why uh, taxes are not high enough on the rich. Uh, so it's very politicized in that, and they, they started from a narrative. And then what I think they did in constructing their history is they went back and cherry picked only the sources that happened to affirm the story that they wanted to tell and ignored the remainder. And some of that cherry pickings post hoc. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's cherry picking that occurred, especially in Nicole Hannah Jones's case, after the 1619 project was already out in print and she's starting to take heat from other historians that see obvious errors. So what does she do? Rather than correct those errors, she scrambles about and looks for other historians, oftentimes people that are kind of like on the marginal fringes of, of the scholarly discourse that do happen to share her theories or that uh, lend at least slightly greater credence to those theories. And she'll claim like a, a very nuanced partial concession or nod in her direction. And she'll take that and say, well, we'll see this person vindicates me. He agrees with me when it's not that at all. It's a much more scholarly work that she's misrepresenting. But now she's kind of in this game of pick and choose. And I know she's doing this because I had direct experience with her doing this. Uh, shortly after the 1619 Project came out, um, it came under heat for its interpretation of Abraham Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation, which is a primary area of my own scholarship. I've, I've written a book and dozens of articles on Lincoln's racial beliefs, Lincoln's approach to emancipation, which is a deep, complex, nuanced subject. He is very pro-emancipation, but he pairs it with other policies, one of which is colonization abroad. And Nicole Hannah-Jones, she at least had enough familiarity with the subject that she forthrightly acknowledged this component of Lincoln, that uh, uh, colonizing the slaves, uh, and he did so voluntarily, but he wanted uh, former slaves to move to Liberia and Central America after emancipation. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a complexity of uh, emancipation. It's not the only part of the story, but it's there. And she acknowledges this and she catches heat from historians that uh, for various reasons have been more reluctant to engage that part of Lincoln scholarship. Mm -hmm. And this is the weeks after the 1619 project comes out. She's in the middle of the controversy over Lincoln as well as other things. Well, what does she do? She starts looking around for sources that validate uh, her claims that she made about Lincoln and colonization, she found my book, probably discovered it by Googling it and saw that, hey, here's a book that was written on this entire subject. And lo and behold, it does walk through the evidence and lends greater credence to her side than some of her early critics. So she tweeted it out. She cited it and says, well, see, the, the, the latest scholarship uh, agrees with me on this point about Lincoln. Someone conveniently pointed out to her that I was the author of that 
after I had just published an essay critiquing Matthew Desmond, she went completely silent, stopped referencing it. And, you know, a few months later, whenever my name comes up, she starts attacking me personally with this ad hominem stuff, uh, accusing me of not being qualified to evaluate the 1619 project. So it's completely political on her, her, her part. Um, yeah, you know, the other element of this is we've seen um, in the aftermath of the 1619 project, this is where I do think there is conscious deception at play. Um, in September of last year, September 2020, uh, Nicole Hannah Jones went on TV and I think she was responding to Trump or some of the other critics on the political right mm -hmm. that were pointing out the 1619 project as part of their the, the 1776 commission's objectives. Uh, so she went on CNN to defend it and they asked her a question about, uh, well, you know, is there a basis to some of the criticism you've received because you made this claim that your goal with the 1619 project was to replace the year 1776 with 1619 as the American founding. Mm -hmm. And she's sitting there on live television on CNN. And she basically goes, I never, I never claimed that. I never made that statement. And not only myself, but dozens of scholars and journalists that have been following this project, uh, we start scratching our heads. And I, I think it was on Twitter, people start posting lists of all the documented times where she had made that exact claim uh, over the previous year. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's in interviews, it's public lectures. Uh, I mean, it, it was uh, like Orwellian in the way that she was denying uh, that she'd ever made this argument. So I start thinking, and I'm like, wait a minute, not only do I remember her making that argument, it was in the text on the website of the New York Times in the original August 2019 version of the 1619 Project. So what do I do? I go back to the New York Times' website and read it, and suddenly that line's not there. Uh -huh. And I, I'm sitting here thinking, am I going crazy? I clearly remember this being said, but it's no longer there. So People I, had screenshots, so, yeah. And, and I find, you know, back in the first week after it's published, this was a major point of contention. Yeah, there's op-eds written about uh, this, this really radical type of claim of replacing 1776 as the true founding. Um, and then I, I'm like, well, what happened here? So I went to an archived copy of the original New York Times website, and it turns out sometime in around January of 2020, right before the Pulitzer Prize was handed out that they were angling for, somebody went in at the New York Times' website and they deleted the controversial lines of text. So I write this up in an article, uh, published it, put the screenshot side by side. Uh, it's all there. This is clear journalistic misconduct. It's malpractice. It was an attempt to deceive the public. One of their own uh, writers at the New York Times, Brett Stevens, the columnist, a couple weeks later, devotes his column to basically saying, what's going on with the 1619 Project? And he quotes me and he quotes the evidence that I had put forth uh, showing that they had altered their text after the fact and not disclosed it. And this apparently causes like a... a um, uh, an outburst in the New York Times' newsroom as the uh, woke partisans of the political left that defend the 1619 Project, not only are they furious of this revelation, they start calling for Brett Stevens to be fired because he cr criticized their own writer, Nicole Hannah-Jones. So it's, it's moving into Orwellian absurdity stacked upon even greater absurdity for an explicit purpose of deception. And that's where I think the project has really jumped the shark. That's where it's gone from interpretive disagreement into outright journalistic and scholarly misconduct uh, about what it's doing. And now it's in your children's school. Yes. So, you know, like I said at the outset, you know, I, I, I am concerned on this channel about that. So getting your feedback is really important. I want my audience to understand that to the extent they include the 1619 project as part of the curriculum, it is not going to be introduced to your kindergartner, your fifth grader, or even your 12th grader as journalism. Right. First of all, your child isn't going to know the difference between journalism and history. And it's presented historically, like it's presented as history. And here's the key. It's presented in a vacuum. Yeah. So even if we wanted to suggest that it's a good idea for students to learn critical thinking by comparing and contrasting different people's perspectives about historical events, you would still have to include some of your work 
right? Or somebody else's work on the subject side by side and ask the kids to read them both and then compare and contrast and actually look at sources. You'd have to ask the kids to be historians, but that presupposes they're reading proficiently. That presupposes they understand research methodology. I mean, there are college students who aren't capable of that. So my point is, you know, be very skeptical of this and understand it is being taught as history and it is not in any sense of the word history. It's a person's point of view or analysis of historical events, but it's not how we teach American history in K-12. Um, but in terms of the messaging, so leaving aside the facts that you know, or the evidence that will be put forth in front of kids using 1619 curriculum, what messages are you concerned the kids are going to get using this type of curriculum? We, we form our opinions about ourselves, our country, our own history by what we're taught about it. So what do you think they're likely to come away with if this is what they get? Well, the first thing to be aware of, none of these curricula that are being pushed out uh, through political means in the classroom are going to ever contain the disclaimer that says the New York Times had to correct portions of the 1619 project. They're not going to have the disclaimer that says, well, uh, part of the text of this project was deleted from the website. They're not going to have the disclaimer that says dozens of historians from across the political spectrum have disputed these assertions. Right. Uh, that's not being taught in there. I'd be okay with it if someone wanted to build the lesson around the controversy that included the 1619 project among multiple uh, perspectives and areas and debated what's true, what's false, what's contestable about it. That's a healthy exercise. That's something that you're more likely to see in an, in an advanced classroom if they do it at all, but that's not what's going on in here. Uh, right. That's not part of their curriculum. It's not part of the goals of the New York Times. They want to be taught as basically the main way that American history is interpreted and understood. And what do you do then? Uh, well, you get a, a, um, a version of American history that is constructed entirely around 2020s politics and politics and from the political left. When Okay. So when you say, explain to the audience what you mean when you say 2020s politics, and you also mentioned presentism. Yes. Explain what you mean by that. Yeah. So 2020s politics, this is what you see directly in the editorial asides that are throughout the 1619 Project. Uh, it lines up very, very conveniently with kind of a, um, a left progressive idea of how the U.S. economy should be regulated and restructured, how wealth should be redistributed. Uh, Nicole, Nicole Hannah Jones has said many times that she's trying to make the political case for slavery reparations. That's another of her goals that she states in there. And, you, you know, I said, regardless of whether where you stand on the issue of slavery reparations, that's an editorial purpose that's separate and apart from U.S. history. Uh, but but you see the political angle throughout her writings, throughout Matthew Desmond's writings and some of the other essays um, of the 1619 Project. And it's certainly there in the curriculum. What do I mean by presentism? Well, this is a, a, a way of looking at the past through a lens that's very much wedded to current day politics. Uh, this is a way of looking at the past, not as figures of the past saw themselves, not as people interpreted these events as they're unfolding, but as uh, as if you were to take someone from the year 2021 and stick them in the past where they are observing these events and they're interpreting it through the lens of the Trump versus Biden presidential campaign, or they're interpreting it through the lens of a, um, a political editorial writer for the New York Times today. Uh, that's a big part of how the 1619 Project approaches its historical subject matter. Now, some of that's going to be uh, inescapable if you're journalists. Uh, some of that's even present in historical scholarship. Uh, we, we do tend to import our ideas from the current day into how, into how we interpret the past. But uh, there's very little awareness that's given in this version of, uh, of history that the perspective they're writing from is guided from the current day and how they see themselves in our current political situation. And the result of that is every lens into the past from this perspective is going to be distorted by 2020s era politics. Right. And I also, it's 2020s values, value system. And that's been something I've observed in the teaching of history in general in America for the last at least 30 years, if not more, is this tendency to drop all context 
when it comes to evaluating the people of the past. So we're not even looking at the events, but to decide who is good and who is bad. And then what I've seen recently is um, a determination that we don't either don't need to learn about someone because we deem them bad by today's value standards or everything they ever touched, everything they ever did is is bad or invalid. Like even the Declaration of Independence now is being called into question because it was drafted primarily by, you know, Thomas Jefferson who owned slaves and, or then, you know, George Washington statues and names shouldn't be anywhere because he, you know, didn't, didn't have the power to free Martha's slaves, right? <laughs> he, d- he didn't do it. And therefore he's a bad person. So this all or nothing, almost canceling of historical figures, because that's in the vernacular today, I'm going to use that word. Um, <laughs> We, it, because they we're using the the present day lens of value judgment, and it, it's my understanding as a scholar, you set values aside, you know, while you're looking at the facts, as you said, following the facts where they lead, and not saying, you know, I've I'm following the facts to see what, you know, to prove a point that this person was good or this person was bad, based on, I mean, and that's not even objective, right. good or bad, right? So, um, I mean, it can be, but I'm saying if you're, if you're looking at today's version of good and bad and in, t- in the past, it's going to be very different. Um, I see that a lot and I'm worried that children are going to get confused by that. Um, they have no frame of reference because they don't know enough about the world. Now I've, I've heard Nicole Hannah Jones say she was a history major, but she brags about not taking any European history. Right. Right. I find that very strange. How could you possibly formulate a thesis about American history without that. I just, I don't know how you would, there'd be so much missing, Yeah. but I don't know. That's my point of view. Um, so moving forward, I know that you and several other, many other scholars wrote to Pulitzer. Did you ever get a response? That's an interesting uh, angle to it. So uh, we, we did, I, I was a signer on a letter that called for the Pulitzer prize to be retracted. And the thing that, that, convinced me, the thing that uh, switched me over to that side into thinking that this is uh, um, a necessary journalistic ethics move that uh, had to be made was after the New York Times edited the text mm. and made uh, the controversial passages dis- disappear. That uh, That's just such a, um, a breach of journalistic ethics. It's in the same territory as plagiarism. Or if we discovered that uh, um, a scholar had faked their data and uh, normally what would happen is that the piece would be retracted and uh, there would be professional sanctions. The New York Times uh, deserves those sanctions and definitely rose to that level when they edited the text. We did not get a response from the Pulitzer Prize other than a very generically worded uh, uh, press release where they acknowledged that there was controversy uh, going on and then then basically said there was nothing they were going to do. Um, The other instances, and this goes back to right after the 1619 Project came out, I attempted multiple times to go through the appropriate channels at the New York Times itself uh, to seek factual corrections to the errors in the Matthew Desmond piece. You know, they pride themselves as the paper of record. The New York Times runs a robust corrections page uh, almost every day. They uh, they have retracted articles uh, that have been found to be deficient in recent memory. Uh, several of their po- foreign policy reporting pieces um, over the last uh, five or 10 years uh, they found errors in them and they issue appropriate retractions. And, and I'm sitting here thinking, okay, well, at least they're a paper of record. I may not agree with them, but uh, they do have a process to seek factual corrections. The first attempt to do that, I pointed out how Matthew Desmond had misused data from another set of scholars to reach a conclusion about the economics of slavery that the authors of the piece that he drew that data out of had basically come out and said, no, you're misusing this. Uh, They've come out and said that uh, historians and the new history of capitalism school have misinterpreted their work and are using it to reach uh, conclusions that they do not have in evidence. Um, So it's a very clear case of a a scholarly issue where uh, a correction is warranted. Uh, The New York Times completely ignored me. Uh, they didn't. They, they never responded. I went through all the forms on their website to say this is how you submit a request for a correction. Nothing. Uh, I pointed that out to Nicole Hannah Jones on Twitter, and she denied that she ever received it. She gave one of those messages like, "Well, uh, your response got lost in the email," 
And I, I, so I posted the receipts. I pointed uh, clearly where it had been entered into their system and then silence from that. Uh, the second time I tried again, uh, I went, um, you know, I, I went and looked up the direct uh, uh, email address of the editor of the New York Times Magazine, Jake Silverstein, uh, along with Nicole Hannah Jones. And I thought, well, you know, I'm going to submit another request for a uh, correction to their uh, uh, their website, but I'm going to carbon copy the people that are the actual editors on this. And what it did is it pointed out an instance where Matthew Desmond had made a claim. Uh, and it's like one of these little flippant asides, but it's a pretty serious claim. He says, Microsoft Excel spreadsheets in the present day, uh, he claimed that they were lineally descended from the accounting books on the plantations. Uh, it actually sounds kind of crazy, uh, but he says Microsoft Excel is um, is a product of, um, uh, of the influence of plantation accounting books. Of course, this is historically nonsense. Accounting books have been used since like the 14th century in Italy, uh, derived completely independently of slavery. Yes, slave owners used accounting books. Even the Soviet <laughs> Union uses accounting books. Uh, I so mean. It's a completely nonsensical historical claim, let alone to say that it comes from Microsoft Excel. And Desmond attributed this claim to a book by another scholar named Caitlin Rosenthal, who's one of these new historians of capitalism. So I went to the Caitlin Rosenthal book and opened it up and, and checked the source to see, did she ever make this claim? Right. And in fact, she says the exact opposite. She says, uh, even though I'm, I'm studying the accounting history of slavery, I am not claiming that Microsoft Excel in the present day derives from uh, the accounting books of, uh, of the plantations. So I quoted these passages side by side and, and sent them this note. And it's, it's kind of, what's going on here? Your own cited source referenced in the text right. does not support Matthew Desmond on this claim. Does this not need a, uh, a correction? And Silverstein just kind of blew me off. He responded and says, well, we talked to Caitlin Rosenthal. And while the language there was a little imprecise, uh, we don't think that there's a, an error here. This is open to interpretation. Uh, just kind of give it, giving me the runaround. Uh, and that was the last that I heard of them uh, from the New York Times directly. And shortly after that, Nicole Hannah Jones, every time that my critiques in my book were mentioned um, as one of the responses that found some errors in the 1619 project, she just turned to personal ad hominem attacks. And it, it ranges everything from, well, he's just a white guy. Uh, so it's attacked on my uh, attacks on my race and gender uh, to she attacked my qualifications, uh, even though she had previously cited my work before she knew it was me, uh, just just completely unprofessional conduct. And it turns out I'm not the only one she does this to. She's made similar attacks to leading historians that have called her work into question. She's made attacks on African-American scholars on Twitter, like really unprofessional behavior uh, for a New York Times reporter. Uh, uh, there were uh, a, 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 an African-American scholar wrote a critique of um, uh, her essay in the 1619 Project, and she she posted a picture of herself uh, just making obscene facial gestures at him. Says, and it was like, this is what I think of your contribution. And this is grade school, um, like bully style behavior. Right. Uh, and, and even though she's acting as the bully, she always claims that she's the victim, that she's been uh, treated abusively because people have critiqued her work. Meanwhile, she's throwing out insults and obscenities and uh and uh, gestures, profane gestures. Uh, she's attacking people on an ad hominem level. Uh, and that's really kind of been her tactic ever since uh, uh, the dialogue degraded directly because the New York Times would not mm -hmm. address serious substantive critiques and findings of error in their work. Yeah, and I just, you know, I'm listening to you talk and I just keep thinking how many times I've heard, even recently, um, young people students in particular the fight at, over at chapel hill yeah. um defending her uh referring to her work as you know the real history the true history the truth they don't want you to know these kinds of things and it, it just it breaks my heart because as you said they're not going to make these corrections or is not going to be a disclaimer um parents don't necessarily know and just a, as a little inside thing i was participating in a conversation with uh, some parents and Randy Weingarten. You know who she is, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, Randy, I, I was brought into the conversation to ask about curriculum because the, the parents were talking mostly about, you know, masking and things. And there wasn't much time left for me at the end. 
And I, she said, well, I'm very concerned about teaching, you know, I'm a social studies teacher originally. And so I'm very concerned about teaching the truth about history and a real history. I said, do you consider 1619 Project to be the truth? And her answer was, well, 1619 is a very important date. And so is 1776. They're both very important dates. And students need to learn about, students need to learn about these very important dates. And I remember thinking as she's talking, I kept, so I, I kept trying to press the point and we ran out of time, but she was equivocating. You know, she really didn't want to stick her neck out there on something that somebody who is a social studies teacher or claims to be and claims to be concerned about real history just should do. I mean, that's about integrity. This isn't about whether you, you know, want to not teach slavery. This is just about how you teach and at least teach. If you want, if you're saying you want to teach truth, teach truth. No one's suggesting we not teach the good, the bad, and the ugly. But I think it's especially ugly to teach things that are false yeah. um, to children in particular where they can't question it. So um, what do you suggest to parents um, if they have a child who's going into a school and this the teacher hands out this stuff? I mean, because um, parents might feel like, oh, gosh, I don't have the knowledge to challenge this, or I don't feel comfortable. And obviously you can watch this on, on loop (laughs) and take notes. And I would encourage people to pick up a copy of, um, of your book as well. And that is a 1619 project at critique. If you want more details, is there anything else that they should do or any other way they could combat it? If they don't have a choice, the kid's going to go have to do these lessons. What would you suggest that they that they look at that it might be more for the kids age range are there things you like for teaching kids about american history slavery do you have any favorite references that are younger sure well you know one thing i'll say is just in terms of the 1619 project itself if if kids are are receiving this and only this in the classroom uh, i would urge parents to present them with the other side uh the multiple other sides uh show them some of the criticisms of the 1619 project I mean, I'll plug my own work in this, and it's one of the chapters in my book, and it's uh, also available online, uh, free of charge, if you go to AIER.org, um, is fact-checking the 1619 Project and its critics. And what I do is I break down uh, basically the four main areas of criticism of uh, controversy around the 1619 Project, and I walk through what the evidence says. I give the sources. I give uh, uh, quotations of the competing viewpoints and try to come up with an assessment to, uh, to evaluate uh, who is correct and why. Uh, mm-hmm. It's a very accessible, easy ar- article to read. It's shorter than the 1619 Project itself, so it's there, uh, but, but it walks through the gist of where the criticism occurs. And uh, I'd urge parents, you know, get your kids to read something like that and allow them to formulate their own conclusions, allow them to, uh, to compare and contrast and come up with the uh, um, that an assessment that fits the evidence. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's one thing that I, I'd urge people to do. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm also always a fan of going back to the original documents, go back to the original sources, read the Declaration of Independence, read abolitionist tracts, read Frederick Douglass's speeches on the Constitution, uh, read what the pro-slavery types were saying. Uh, one thing that's missing in the, uh, in the uh, Matthew Des- Desmond piece when he is assessing capitalism, uh, he does not give any intellectual history about what proponents of capitalism were advocating in the 19th century. Uh, Because if he did that, he'd have to engage uh, the heirs of Adam Smith, the author of The Wealth of Nations. Well, it turns out Adam Smith is an abolitionist. Uh, The father of capitalism is an abolitionist. That does not fit well with the theory that (laughs) capitalism and slavery are wedded together. Uh, So this is a point that I've made several times, and they never really want to address it. Because, uh, you know, if, if you're saying that capitalism is tainted by slavery, and yet uh, the main book uh, writing our, our theoretical understandings of what capitalism is, the closest uh, articulation, what sets the stage for free market theory to emerge, is also an abolitionist book that condemns slavery. You've got a problem there. Something's wrong with your theory. And Smith's errors are even more explicit about that. The, uh, the economists in the 19th century that consider themselves Smithian are also abolitionists up to the Civil War itself. You can right. follow that trajectory. Uh, and meanwhile, it's it, it's actually the pro-intervention people, the people that want the government to step in and manage the economy. 
they are the pro-slavery uh, types. So one figure that I point in my work that I bring to the uh, the forefront, he's, a, he's really this horrendous guy. He's a theorist by the name of George Fitzhugh. And he was the leading pro-slavery person that debated the abolitionists in the 1850s, uh, traveled all over the country and uh, gave pro-slavery talks. Well, Fitzhugh wrote a book where he declares that the doctrines of capitalism are at war with slavery. And if a slave owner wants to defend slavery, what they need to do is throw the books of Adam Smith and Jean Baptiste Say and David Ricardo into the fire, because those are the books that are going to undermine slavery. He's that radical um, in his perspective as an anti-market, anti-capitalist. Uh, right. And none of them want to talk about it. And I say, you know, if you read these texts, you read some of these excerpts and show your kids this, show uh, show students this. Uh, it's very, very hard for them to walk away from an essay like Matthew Desmond and think that the sky is being truthful or being representative of, uh, of the full array of right. facts. And, and, I, and I've said something else on my channel. I've gotten a little pushback on it. I understand why people get insulted, but I'm not trying to be insulting. I'm trying to make an observation. Don't assume that because someone has teacher in their title, yeah. that they are a subject matter expert in that subject. That's just not even how teachers today are educated. And so you, you know, the person who majors in history, for example, isn't necessarily your history teacher, and even they might not be adequate, right? right. Um, so it's not necessarily that the teacher is intentionally trying to misinform your child. They themselves may have been educated using similar theories to what Nicole Hannah Jones and Desmond are, are pushing, and you may end up having to educate the teacher. So right. if you go in guns blazing, you're probably not going to get an, a great reception. Yeah. But if instead, as you're recommending, you offer up the alternative view or, you know, you ask a teacher, have you heard of this? Or can I show you something? Can I share something with you? And you engage with the teacher, you might well find they're receptive. Um, I had that experience with my daughter's ninth grade history teacher, and they were working on World War II and various things. And I, uh, she actually asked if I could come in and give a talk because I had lived in Austria and I had traveled extensively in Germany and so forth. I had, I spoke German back in the day and I traveled in the East Bloc countries as well. And she felt there was some misinformation going on about Hitler and communism and things like that. So I went in and I just spent the entire class period talking about what I observed. I read some quotes from Hitler, but I didn't tell them who, whose they were. <laughs> and I just, you know, read some quotes about the individual and the individual is dangerous and all that because they were dissing individualism in the class right. Right. and they didn't know. And I said, well, that, that would be Hitler, you know? So we kind of, and we had this whole, whole conversation and at the end of it, the teacher came up and he said, I really have to thank you for doing this. I have never traveled to those areas. I was born after, you know, the fall of the wall and I didn't know any of this, never learned it. And I learned something today. So thankfully he was humble and, you know, open to hearing it, but you don't know. So you might as well try. Like, it's my theory. If you, if you run into this in your kid's school, go in with the benefit of the doubt that they're using the curriculum that's given to them and maybe offer up some of these alternatives. That's my thought. Do you have any other kind of parting thoughts on this whole topic? And it doesn't have to relate to kids in education, but just it could even be scholarship in general. I'm very concerned about, you know, uh, you know, what's happening to empiricism in America. <laughs> but... It's a very shared concern. You know, what I, I would say to parents is save your anger, save your ire for the New York Times itself. Save it. Uh, uh, th those are the people that have actually engaged in malpractice. Uh, focus your frustration on the content of Nicole Hannah Jones's and Matthew Desmond's pieces, because that's th th those are people that uh, uh, shirked their duty to be uh, scholarly communicators to the public, even though they were afforded a platform of huge, immense influence. Uh, they used that for political reasons and abusive reasons rather than uh, to get at the truth. Uh, the person in the classroom that's teaching this, uh, for all we know, this may have been just handed to them because the local school board has dictated it. They have no choice. Uh, so don't be angry at the at the teacher that's actually doing it. Uh, just as you say, this these are the people you want to have the conversation with. Uh, these are the people that you want to show 
uh, that there is indeed a controversy around the 1619 Project. And, you know, I think most uh, most Americans are reasonable people. Uh, they aren't the New York Times. It's precisely because they're not the New York Times and its steadfast adherence to, uh, uh, I mean, almost encourageability about uh, correcting this. Uh, that's where the New York Times gets into trouble uh, with the quality of the project that it's, it's releasing. Parents and teachers can have a conversation, though, that are not bound by that. Uh, and then it can actually be constructive in showing them another way, showing them other alternative positions. Right. And if you can't, and if they're not receptive or you can't reach them because they put up a giant wall, because that's happening too, um, I would say engage your child. That would be my last thing to say is, you know, if the, if the child is very, very young, it's going to be more difficult. But the older they get, engage them. Just make sure they know without, you know, um, being too, too hard on the the teacher, of course, because that will be jarring for the child. Um, just let them know there's another, there are other points of view to consider. And um, that was done for me when I was growing up and it helped a lot. So, well, Phil, I have to thank you so, so much. You've given me an hour of your time and to my audience as well. So thank you. And again, I hope everyone will consider taking a look at the, um, uh, the, the critiquing the 1619 project and its critics, right? That's the, the one on the website, right? AEIR and also 1619 project to critique, um, just to inform yourself. If you're watching this and 1619 is something you kind of heard about on Fox News somewhere or, you know, like you kind of read about it on Twitter, but you really aren't familiar, um, dig in a little bit because um, you will likely see it in your child's classroom. Absolutely. At some point. So thank you very much. And uh, thanks for everybody for, for watching today.